Hi there, and welcome back to Books with Beth. Today, we're looking at Siege and Storm, the sequel to Shadow and Bone, a book I reviewed a while ago. The link to that video will be in the description, so go and watch it if you haven't already. The style of this video will be different from that one, though. I don't want to do too much recapping, but rather get straight to my thoughts and opinions. Therefore, keep in mind that this video will have spoilers. Also, you may notice that this video has actual footage that I shot, and not just photos or stock videos. I recorded my watercolor painting process of this fan art, and I hope you've enjoyed watching it. First of all, I can't believe Genya betrayed Alina. She was my favorite character in the first book, the eyeshadow to the bone, the foundation of the book. Apparently, she'd been working with the Darkling the entire time, helped him stage the coup, and never sent Alina's letters to Mal. The king becomes super unhealthy because she poisoned him, and the queen looks like she aged 20 years without Genya's magic. Power to her, though, because they did treat her really terribly. But I just really missed her presence in the second book. The best part of this book is Sturmhond, in my opinion. The biggest fish in the Sturm Pond. It's funny that he would do anything for the biggest purse, or, in other words, to secure the bag. Also, I like his attitude that when people say impossible, they usually mean improbable. Ever since we first met him, I've been wondering if Sturmhan was going to be a love interest for Alina. That'd be fine with me. I like him more than Alina's other options, anyway. And I like him even more when he reveals himself to be Nikolai Lantsov, the son of the king, who brought the Sun Summoner back. He gives no warning to anyone else, though, causing it to seem like a betrayal and resulting in a punch from Alina. I guess you could call this a royal disaster. Later on, Nikolai asks Alina to be his queen, pissing Mal off. I kind of want her to accept, since Nikolai has a more interesting dynamic with her and Alina seems to like him anyway. Nikolai says it would just be political alliance, not love, but somehow I doubt that. It's interesting that he's capable of cruelty, too, like when he tries to hunt the Volcra using Alina's powers. His story of how he cut off the enemy's fingers and fed them to his dog also shows that he's barking mad. I just hope he doesn't take having a dark side too seriously, like the Darkling did. And due to Nikolai, as well as the fact that Mal doesn't really belong within the role of Alina's guard, Mal and Alina experience a lot of turbulence. More of a plane than a ship, huh? I'm just hoping they break up faster, since Nikolai is very much available. The three-way love square, if we're still counting the Darkling, which I don't think Alina is at this point. Anyways, it does make me wonder how many love interests will be in this series. Will Alina simply add them up to have a quad by the end? I've heard that quads take a whole lot of open communication and maturity to work, though, which isn't exactly how I would describe this group. Then. There's the matter of people who believe Alina to have died on the fold. Some of them sell her bones as good luck charms, as superstition. If she were alive, though, I'm sure they would want her to break a leg, both in her performance as a saint and literally for a profit. Throughout the second half of the book, I loved reading about the progression of how Alina settles into her role as captain of the second army. It's difficult, very difficult. No cap, meaning no captain, because she hasn't figured it out in the beginning. Anyways, hers is a very fragile position. One could even call it no man's land. But it seems like she's learning from the numerous lessons that Nikolai gives her. For example, giving Fedor the order to tidy up before they go to the palace seems like a turning point for her, which I found interesting. Something I hate, or rather, someone, is Vasily. He was just so boring. I found myself hoping he gets kicked out by Nikolai because I simply didn't want to hear anything from him again. He eventually leaves on his own for a temporary thing because he can't take the workload, which makes me pretty happy. But he eventually comes back from his little workshop thing that ended up not being a little workshop thing at all, but rather an obvious trap from the Fjerdens, who have an alliance with the Darkling. So Vasily gave Ravka away via one of the logging paths. He's just so fucking stupid, man. Or maybe it's just time for me to log off today. But how could he hear that the Fjerdens, a group who has many things against the Ravkins, want to make an alliance with them in exchange for one specific logging path and go, yeah, that seems legit. 
Nothing wrong or weird about the situation. One of the Darklings creatures kill him in the end though, so it's all good. Amidst the panic of the palace being attacked by the Darklings beasts, the second army tries to fight, but there's just too many beasts overpowering them. Sounds rough, huh? They're gonna need a lot of drinks when this is over. Might I suggest some spirits? Anyways, they then try to escape to Upper Town, but it looks like the army of creatures is going to kill them. Then suddenly, the first army comes back to help. Obviously, the first army is number one, so they manage to help and in the end, they find a passageway in the chapel that will allow them to escape. One that was used by the Apparat. When they're found by the Darkling, Alina chooses to go with him to save everyone else. Somehow, she reaches through the connection created by the Caller to take his power. She uses it to create many shadow creatures to exhaust him to death. It comes at great risk to her, as she almost dies, but luckily Mal saves her. Less lucky, though, is the fact that her power is now gone. And that's the cliffhanger the author leaves us with, as we finish the second book. So, what are my final thoughts? I would give this book a solid 4 out of 5, one star higher than the first, because of the addition of Nikolai. I just found it interesting that the story caused Elena to be more involved with royalty, and less with the Darkling. I'll admit, the Darkling was sort of entertaining in the first book, but Nikolai is much better. The pace is kind of the same as the first book too, though, quite slow and with a lot of bland parts, so I wouldn't say it's 5 star material. And that's all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did get this far, please like, comment with a purple emoji, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Bye!